Good morning. I am very privileged to lead us in communion this morning. And I hope that it's not just a ritual, not just a routine that we do, um, but really that we take a moment to really reflect um, that it'll be a moment to connect with God as we um, partake of the communion elements. And as we know, you know, the bread, it represents Christ's body broken for us, and the cup, it represents Christ's blood poured out as a sacrifice for us. And, you know, Jesus said to do this in remembrance of Him. And so that's what um, I hope that we do this morning, is really remember Christ and what He's done for us and what a difference it makes. You know, I was just thinking about how some TV shows or movies have these parallel universes, right? Um, where one universe is one way and another universe is a different way, but time is kind of at the same pace. Um, and so I was just thinking, like, what would life be like in a parallel universe without Jesus, without his, his sacrifice on the cross, without his resurrection? And for us to really think about our own life, too, what would life be without Christ? And for me, I mean, that's terrifying. That's just, I just know that his sacrifice made a huge difference, has made a huge difference in my life. You know, not, I mean, now and eternally, right? Both. There's no way I could get to heaven out of my own merit, out of my own goodness. I'm not that great. I am not perfect. I do not deserve heaven for eternity, nor do I deserve a relationship with God, with a holy, righteous God. Like, I don't deserve that, but yet, because of Christ, I have that. You know, I know a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, when they think of me, maybe they think of Oh, she's so deserving of being a pastor. Oh, she's such a good person. But really, it's about Christ. It's not me that makes me good. It's not me that makes me worthy of being a pastor. Because believe me, on my own, I do not deserve such a privilege. Um, but it's because of Christ, because of his grace. So. Two things when I think about it is part of it is that, you know, when he found me, I had, I was like looking for love in all the wrong places in a sense. Um, I was hoping for a guy to fill the emptiness inside and they just couldn't. They couldn't complete me, you know, but I can say that Christ completes me. I can look into his love his loving eyes and say, you complete me because I feel whole that this wholeness that I could never get from an earthly relationship. The other thing is that I am so thankful for his grace because of Jesus, because of the sacrifice on the cross, my sins are forgiven. I have, I can live in forgiveness, forgiveness of others, forgiveness for myself. Like I can forgive myself, but mostly God has forgiven me. And I have eternal life, but I also have joy in this life on earth as well. And you know, it says in Romans 3, 23 to 25, it says for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. 
And I am so thankful that I am made right with God because of Jesus and His shedding of His blood. There's no way I could be in a relationship with a holy God without that. There's no way I could be a pastor without that. There's no way I could just even be considered a good person without that. I just realize I know that my righteousness comes from Christ. And so let's partake this morning and in remembrance and in gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, that you have given us so much through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, Lord. We thank you. We take this bread in remembrance of your body broken for us. We wouldn't want to live in a world without you. We thank you, Lord, that we can have hope, we can have peace, we can feel complete. And we also take this cup in remembrance of your blood shed upon the cross, just truly wiping away our sins. We thank you, Lord, that we are made whole, we are made right, we, that you have taken our sins as far as east is from the west. We thank you that you have cleaned our slate white as snow. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, good morning. Welcome, church family, and those of you who are watching for the very first time from wherever you're at, thank you for joining us. What am I doing? Hey, I'm cooking breakfast here. It's getting important, actually. Uh, I bought these Costco sausages and trying for the very first time. I'll let you know how it tastes. But hey, what did you guys eat for breakfast this morning? Please let us know. Chat below. We'd love to hear from you. You must be wondering, what has breakfast got to do with church? You know, I love Jesus because Jesus didn't want the church to be a religious institution. Instead, he wanted the church to be a family, a movement of believers, furthering his kingdom and building relationship with one another. You know, when in John chapter 21, when the disciple just experienced an incredible miracle of hauling in a ton of fish when all night they couldn't catch a single one, as they approached Jesus, verse 9 tells us that he had breakfast waiting for them. He had breakfast waiting for them. And so, hey, if you guys want to come over on a Sunday morning to watch the service together, I can have breakfast waiting for you as well. Just don't tell my wife because she doesn't know yet. But anyway, um, we're going to be praying for the offering right now. And before we do that, I want us to uh, lift up those people who are in the Ukraine. We're going to take a special offering for them starting today all the way till Saturday where you can write your checks to them uh, via Hope Chapel Mililani. Just on the memo, uh, say Ukraine or on your type envelope, you can write Ukraine and we'll be sure to disperse these checks to our four square disaster relief ministry on the mainland and they will get to the proper people. But did you know we have 32 four square churches in the Ukraine, uh, as well as orphanages and, and um, drug rehab ministries. So this is really important for them because they need emergency housing to food, to essential supplies. So uh, if you can give above and beyond, that would be so helpful. So shall we just pray for the offering? Father God, we want to lift you up, Lord God. And Father, even as we sit here in the comforts of our home having breakfast, Father, we want to remember those who don't have that privilege right now, who are struggling, who are refugees, who need your help and your comfort and your protection. So we pray for those people, Father God, who are in the Ukraine. Uh, have, a, have that hedge of protection surrounding our Foursquare Church family as well over there. And we just want to lift up the tithes and the offerings to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we have just a few quick announcements. The first one is we have Deeper Night this coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And remember last week's message about the cost of discipleship, the first action step that was that we meet together, that we journey together in this. So Deeper Night would be a great time for us to worship and seek the Lord for all, all, all these different matters that are happening around the world, as well as here in Milani, because next Saturday, we're gonna have our pastoral transition service. That's gonna be a big one, and we hope all of you can make it. And Pastor Jared and Pastor Tim have reiterated that this service is not gonna be about them, but it's all about God and His faithfulness. And I can attest to that, where God has shown us and revealed to us how Pastor Jared would be the next senior pastor of this church. So this, these are exciting times. We're gonna be using the Grace Point Sanctuary as well as the Breezeway, so uh, the capacity will be uh, much larger in that. So we truly want to invite all of you to be a part of this special transition event. So please be there. Speaking of events, hey, let's go back to Grace Point because my wife, Chiomi Chow, is going to receive her pastoral license. So real exciting time. Okay, shall we go there? All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to read this. This is from the Foursquare Church. It says license to preach. Uh, this this certifies that Mary Chow or Mary Chiomi Chow, as you know her, has been recognized by the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel as a licensed minister to preach, conduct services, and administer religious ordinances in accordance with the Declaration of Faith as set forth in its bylaws. Um, take a picture of it after. And I just wanted to, do I have to call you Pastor 
I know she. The, the thing of, I love about my wife here is, is what you see is what you get, right? And uh, she's not into position or titles or any of that. And sometimes I have to like remind her of certain things too, you know. But uh, she's just who she is, and that's what. Uh, and that's why all of you who are here just love her for who she is, uh, because she is a woman of compassion, of mercy, and she's just willing to give that listening ear to whoever you are and spend the time and take the time and be patient with you as she's patient with me, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I survived all these years, wow. And so, um, she has such a great heart and and I cannot say enough about her receiving this uh, pastoral license because it's not about trying to get something. In fact, this just kind of fell on her lap, right, Pastor Tim? Yes. There you go. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Well, uh, it's a big deal. This is a big deal, but a long process behind the scenes. You didn't see everything I had to put up with to get this woman license. No, she was a wonderful student. But before we get into that, I want everyone, every guest who's here tonight for Chiomi, can you just stand up so we can just, she can see you and we can welcome you. Just go ahead and stand up. You came to the gym. We do not have that many licensed female pastors. It's a, it's a huge deal, but we belong to a denomination that is so open to it and searching for, for women who will step forward and take their calling from the Lord. You know, Chiomi and I have been friends for a long time now. We are so close that we decided to share the same birthday. August 17, yeah? We're so close that we cheer for the same football team, the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> I was, I was honored to be able to coach her through the process and then also accompany her uh, during the interview. Because there's three guys, three people, uh, via Zoom, who grill her for like over two hours. It's two and a half hours of questions. And I'm sitting there like, you know, just gritting my teeth and she's doing so good and I'm just like, yeah, and I can't say anything, right? I can't help her, but she didn't need help. She did an amazing job. I'm so proud of her. And the interviewing uh, license board must have agreed because they came on back really quick and their big smiles on their faces and they said, I think one of them said, I hate, what did he say? <laughs> you see, they like joked like it was never going to happen and they're like, nah, I'm just kidding, we got you. Now, now some of you might be wondering, what, did, what does it mean to get a pastor's license? Well, first of all, licensing is our denomination's stamp of approval on a person's preaching abilities, the soundness of their doctrine, and finally the way they live their Christian life. Now, you and I have had the privilege of experiencing these giftings of Chiomi up close and personal. She rocks out in her Christian doctrine. She can preach, amen? Amen, amen. have you heard her preach? She can preach, and she truly is living the life of a follower of Christ. If it's true what Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and the child household is truly blessed, as Terrence will attest to. Because I have heard the stories, and I've personally watched her steer her family through some really difficult times. And what Terrence would always say was, but you know, she's, she, she's peaceful about it, she's got it under control, she's handling it. And Terrence, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really get it from her, yeah? Yeah. And she yeah. just brings the peace. I just like, life. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. She's done it all with peace and grace and tenderness, patience and love. Secondly, licensing is the first step in a pastor's path to eventual ordination. If she chooses to pursue that path, ordination could be in Xiaomi's future. And finally, and most importantly, licensing is a way 
of confirming a person's calling by God. That's the most important thing. So how would a follower know that they're called by God? And available such an honor like this to be available to you. Well, I'm sure that Jesus' disciples wondered that very same thing. So in John 15, 16 and 17, Jesus told his disciples, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. It was a commission to his disciples. See, and we, especially our pastoral staff, we believe that God has chosen our sister for this calling. And she is very, very worthy of it. And so I want to, speak of my staff, I want to invite my staff up, I want to invite my council up, and anyone else who feels led to stand up here with me, you are welcome to come up as we anoint her and as we pray over her. Don't be shy, you can come up. And you get to be in the picture too. <laughs> So, Joey, anything you'd like to say before we go? Of course, I want to say thank you. Thank you all for, for coming out and celebrating with me. And uh, thank you, Pastor Tim, for really guiding me through the whole process, but also just being my pastor. And I'm so thankful that we were able to do this. Especially um, for next week. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jared, too. <laughs> I just want to thank God. Um, you know, yeah, like I said, there's no way this could have happened without His grace upon my life. And um, it's just fun just going for the ride. I don't know. And honestly, you know, I don't know what this means next. I don't know what God is really doing. But hey, if it's God, is good. So I'm just going for the ride, and it's enjoyable. And I'm just really but thank you all for joining me in the, you know, in the journey that we that God has set before us. Well said, well said. In 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul gives a commission to those who desire to serve God's people in this in this way. And I'd like to ask our sister if she believes that she's ready to accept this commission. It comes straight out of 2 Timothy 4. Chiomi. Of course, Chiomi's not in. <laughs> I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Chiyomi, are you ready to accept this charge? We're going to anoint her, and we're going to pick it up again and lay hands. We're going to pray. <laughs> Can we anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Heavenly Father, I can only imagine that you are just beaming with pride at your daughter tonight. The angels are standing watch, they're rejoicing. You are just so excited for this step in her life. You have loved her with an everlasting love all life. You always will. You've always been proud of her, but this is a point. This is a point of uh, a next step for her, so to speak. And so, Lord, yeah, whatever you have for her, she is open. She is ready. She is willing. And we pray, Lord God, that you would anoint her through the presence of the Holy Spirit to a whole other level, Lord, as she moves and serves in this great calling of her life, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself to be next to her at all times, helping her, guiding her, encouraging her, protecting her. Lord, we just thank you. And we praise you. And we celebrate the life of our sister, Chiumi Chow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And congratulations. Congratulations. And we have our pastor coming up.
Hey, aloha everybody. So good to be with you on our online platform. If you and I haven't met yet, I'm Jared. I'm honored to be one of the pastors here. And listen, if this is your first time joining us, maybe somebody shared this link with you or you're new to this whole church thing. Can I tell you how grateful I am that you're tuning in today? You know, here at Hope Chapel Mililani, our prayer is that that everyone that's watching would feel like they're part of a community where they belong even before they believe. And so on behalf of our senior pastor, Tim Gresseth, and our staff, we want to just say a big welcome to you this morning. In fact, this week, as I was preparing for this message, I was kind of reminiscing and thinking back of when I started coming to church, when somebody brought me. And I thought I'd bring a few pictures to show us what I looked like way back in the day where it, when the dinosaurs used to walk the earth. I'm <laughs> just kidding. But as, I, as you're looking at these pictures, I, I just, I'm thinking back and I, I remember it's just interesting. It was interesting because when I started coming to church, I remember that we didn't have much of anything. And for those of you that are regulars, that are veterans, that have been with the church for a while, you know what I mean. I mean that we used to meet in this hot cafeteria every Saturday afternoon. A group of people would drive a box truck with all this stuff in it, right? And we'd set up and we'd break down and we'd fold out these little thin plastic green chairs. And, and I remember we used to cover these cafeteria tables with linen to make a backdrop. And I remember during the hot summer, summers, everybody, man, would be sweating from the heat. But man, you know what? Back in those days, we were all heart. Man, we'd always, you know, like have these incredible times of worship, powerful messages of God's word. And as people would come through the front doors, they were not only greeted by the presence of God, but by five or six smiling uncles and aunties who wouldn't let you come through without a huge hug or a bulletin or a name tag. Man, we didn't have much stuff, but man, we were all heart. And, and much later, I, I, I was able to come on to the staff and I remember the craziest things would start happening. I remember people would visit and afterwards come and say things to me like, man, I don't know what it is, but there's something special about this church. There's something beautiful about this community that I can't put my finger on. It feels like home. And can I tell you that over the last 34 years, that same thing that we started with is the same thing that we continue with all the way to this day. Can you say amen to that? And those of us who follow Jesus, we know that the reason that, that they would say that would be, it's because of him. It's because of Jesus. But more specifically, we felt that early on, Jesus directed us to not only build a church based on the newest trends or the latest fads, but to build a church that was founded on the things that God really cared about. To build a church based on the values that were important to His heart. And I don't know if you know this, but, but sometimes in life, we start moving and, and growing and shifting around a bit, especially in the past couple of years, right? And things kind of get complicated. And so in this space, it's easy to just grow, 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 and get away from the values that you started with. And so today, what I want to do in our time together is dial us back in to the value that is so important to God's heart and is so essential to who we've been and who we are as a church ohana. And so you see, if you're just joining us, we've been in this kind of this series entitled, Who is Jesus, where we've been walking our way through the Gospel of Luke, and we're pursuing the question, who is Jesus, and what's he all about? Like, what is he about in our lives? And if you're, you're with us today, and you, you're not yet convinced of who Jesus says he is, I can't think of a better message for you to catch a glimpse at the heart of God in, because you're going to be able to see what, man, just the, the church is supposed to look like when it values the same thing that God values. And one of the things that we'll be kind of talking about today is so radical, that's so radical about the heart of God is that he has this overwhelming and unapologetic compassion for people. That's the message of our, that's the title of our message today, compassion for people. Someone say compassion. Now, when you think of compassion, what comes to mind? What comes to mind for you? You know, maybe you're thinking, you would think of people like, Mother Teresa, or some, or some person closer to home like Father Damien, or people like Pastor Chiomi, right? Like where just this joy and this, this um, 
smile would just reflect this aspect of compassion. Some of you, when you think of compassion, you, you think of people that are Mr. and Mrs. Aloha, like there's this ooey gooey, you know, like, like love, like, oh my gosh, so good to see you. And it's just this, this aspect of, of what we think of sometimes when we think of the word compassion. But did you know that when you read through the New Testament, specifically that, 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 that there's this compassion that oftentimes is directly correlated to Jesus. Did you know that? Let me give you a couple examples. It would say stuff like Jesus was, a great, uh, was in a, a great crowd of people that were sick and he felt compassion. And so what did he do? He healed them. Or he, he, it says that, that after Jesus saw this large amount of people, he felt compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he taught them. And then after he taught them, he didn't want to send them home hungry. And so he felt compassion on them. And so what did he do? He fed them. In other words, the compassion that Jesus had was not just this ooey gooey feeling that that of something in my heart, like, but no, the, the compassion that Jesus had was just something that caused him to swell up and caused him to move to action. And that's a picture of compassion that I want us to really capture and hold on to this morning. And so what is compassion? What is compassion? Well, if you're taking notes, as you jot this down, compassion is being moved to action by love. Being moved to action by love. That's compassion. That will be one of our anchor points today. Now, what's important for us to understand right off the bat is that Jesus was supposed to be a, the perfect picture of what God is like. You see, back in Jesus' time, it wasn't that there weren't any churches. There were actually a lot of churches, but there were a lot of religious people. And what they would do and what would happen is that these people would act religious, but never capture what God's heart was actually like. They would bind people up and would, would suck the life out of them. And Jesus would come and say, like, say things like, listen, I don't want that for you. I want you to experience life that is fully alive. I want you to experience a life that is abundant. Now, now the thing about Jesus is that, that when he stepped on the scene, he wasn't like anything that anybody expected. Like, as a matter of fact, even if he was with us here today in physical form, I think that many of us would be completely caught off guard by him. Let me give you a couple examples. The people Jesus hung out with was not the typical people that we would imagine him being around. Like when I think about um, who Jesus hung out with, uh, I would think to myself, man, oh man, these guys that he hung out with probably were really good. Or there are people that really had a heart for God. And listen, there are definitely moments where that would happen, but, but at, at, as we look at Scripture, as we look through the Gospels, we see that the majority of Jesus' time was spent with people that I'm not, not sure many of us would ever think of. People that you would think, man, would have problems lying and cheating others. People that you may look at and go, oh man, there's something wrong with that person. And Jesus would hang out with them. He would hang out with the outcasts, the marginalized, and the people that others would have completely written off. Now, why would he do that? Well, it's because he loves people. He loves people. Do you know that God has a heart for everybody? It's not just the people that make good choices. It's not just the people that come to church. God's heart is for every single person. And you know what's crazy? Is that people actually liked Jesus. Now, the religious people, they saw this and they didn't like it at all. Like they, they said things like, man, if Jesus is so good, if you're so good and you're such a good teacher, how can you hang out with people like this? You should know better if you're so good. And the scripture that we'll be kind of unpacking today, we're going to look at Jesus respond to these religious people. And he's going to say things like, he's going to say, hey, listen, you guys, listen, I'm, not, I'm going to tell you three stories and these three stories are going to help you to understand God's heart and what it's actually like. Because you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. And in the same way today, if you're, if, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these three stories. And let me give you a little bit of a hint and a tip. If you're here and you go to church and you follow Jesus, he's talking to you and he's talking to me. He's talking directly to us. And so we need to pay, be able to pay attention to that. 
And so if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, would you go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15? Luke chapter 15. And um, before we look at this, I want to give us a little bit of a tip when you study the Bible, when you study God's Word for yourself. If you read something and you ever see something three times, it means that it's a big deal. If there's a three stories that make the same point, if there's three things that are repeated, it's a really, really big deal. Pay attention to that. The example that I would give to this is, is um, let's just say for you husbands, you husbands in, watching online today, if your wife sends you to the store and tells you, okay, I need you to go get milk and I need you to get some cereal for the morning and, and, and yeah, I need milk and, and some broccoli, milk and bacon, okay? <laughs> Like now, if you show up all, uh, you know, from, from the store and all you bring home is bacon, you're a dead man, aren't you? Right? Because, because if you're going to show up with anything walking through that door, what's it supposed to be? Go ahead and tap it, type it in the chat box right now. What's it supposed to be? That's right. Because if out of the whole list, if you forget anything, don't forget the milk, right? And so in the same way, what Jesus is wanting to teach us in these stories is, is that, and we'll try to hit all three today, but we may just get through one or two, but it, he's trying to say to, to us in this story, these stories, listen, I don't want you to, I want to make sure you don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick it up out of Luke's gospel, chapter 15. Again, verse four is we're going to go and look at the first story that Jesus shares here today. And so this is what it says in verse four, starting in verse four. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? Verse five, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he'll call together his friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Wow, so good. I love this story. Now, now I like to put myself, when I read the scriptures, I like to put myself in the listener's shoes. And, and this is actually a great way to read the Gospels. And so I want to ask you, if you could imagine with me that I, we're there, I'm there, and I'm listening to Jesus that almost it, it share this thing that almost seems like a math problem. I mean, but to me, it kind of, it kind of seems a little off. I mean, Jesus is talking about a shepherd that would leave the 99 and go after the one. And to me, that kind of seems like bad math, right? It's like bad math. Who does that? Because naturally, I'd be thinking to myself, man, 99 out of 100 isn't bad, right? You know, like, like that's, a, that's pretty good odds. I mean, if I had 100 sheep and I only lost one sheep, man, give me a promotion. I'm a good shepherd right there, you know? I'm good. And as I read this, I, I actually, I was actually able to see that firsthand that I, I naturally don't think the way that God thinks. That's not my natural way of thinking. You see, Jesus is giving us a picture of what God is really like and how he thinks and how he feels. He's telling us that he's moved with compassion for the one who is far away from him. And it's not just that he doesn't care about the 99, it's just that there's safety and security that the 99 have in the flock and that one lost sheep is vulnerable. Now, now I think when I read this story, and most of us think as we listen to Jesus share this story, that many of us think that, that he's talking about sheep. But he's talking about you. He's talking about me. This is my story and this is your story. And I think for, for us to understand this parable better, I think that we need to give these sheep a name and not a number, right? For example, let me show you what I mean here. Here's a picture of my four children. And I'm so proud of them. This is my son Jude and my daughter Tess, Ellie, and Macy. Now let me ask you, if one of my kids got lost, maybe in the mall, which has happened, don't judge me, or at the beach, or maybe in another country, how do you think I'd feel in that moment? 
Do you think that I would be at home thinking, oh, thank God, that at least I got three out of my four kids and they're safe and sound at home with me right now? Is that what you'd be thinking if you were me? No way, right? You'd be thinking about the one. I mean, I'm so grateful that the three are safe, but that one is the thing that my heart would be consumed by in that moment. I'd be like, I've got to do everything that I can in my power to find that one that is lost. Now, if you're, you, you're a parent and you have maybe a few kids, maybe three or four kids, you know that if you lose one of them, you don't come home and think, oh yeah, you know, I got three out of the four. That's like 75%. can always make another kid, right? No, none of you would be thinking that way. We, we, we would be like, oh my gosh, I've got to find my child no matter what. And you know, that's exactly how God feels about people. Not just some people, but all people. He looks and says, man, the 99, that's great. I'm so glad that they're there. But the one, the one is the thing that consumes my thoughts. The one is the thing that breaks my heart. And I'll do whatever I can to get to the one. Man, I'll send out search parties, man. I want them to come back home and to experience a real life that I can bring. You see, there's a lot of people who aren't with God because they think that God is against them. They think that God wants to restrict them and control them and give them lickings like an angry father. You know what I'm saying? Where he's like, hey, hey, you, you better get over here. Oh, oh, you better, oh, one, two, three, man, get over it, reaching for his belt. No, that couldn't be further from the truth. You know what God wants to do is he wants to give life. He wants to bring freedom. He wants the people to experience a joy that they've never known. Just like some of you parents for your kids, God wants people to walk with him to have the brightest future possible. But he knows that that future walks along his path. And so like a good shepherd, we see that he goes after the one. And listen, if you're here and you're watching this, and you've ever wondered if God is interested in you, or if He loves you, or if He even likes you, can I tell you that to Him, you are valuable. You are irreplaceable, and you are a very important person to Him. We see that in the story, that the shepherd doesn't, he just doesn't sit back and say, oh man, lost the sheep. I'm just going to wait until the, He wanders back in. No way, right? Man, that shepherd, that, 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 the shepherd is going to go, go out and whatever possible, he's going to go and bring that, that sheep back no matter what. Now listen, my prayer and my hope is that we would be a church that doesn't just value the things that we think are important, but that we would be a church that really catches the heart of God. And God has a compassion for people. And so I want to just give you real quick two points to illustrate this. And so if you're taking notes, would you jot this down? Number one is that if the shepherd would go, so should you. So should I. We should too. If the shepherd would go, we should too. We can't wait for people to come. We must go to them. Right? That's the heart of Jesus. Right? Even the last words that he shares out of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28 where he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He's saying to his disciples, last words, go, go to the nations, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching all of these things that I've commanded you and, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what it says. And, I, and it's so important for us to catch. And I think the reason for this is, is people normally, we need to go because because people don't understand the heart of God. I mean, right now you've got friends, I've got friends that think that God is totally against them. They think that, 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 that all Christians want to do is, is judge them or condemn them and just look at them and their behavior and go, oh man, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And that's not true. Because you know what? No Christian is any better than anybody else. We know that it's by God's grace that we are saved. And the ones that have come to Jesus, we understand that. But people, we, they have this gap, especially people far from God. There's this gap in this distance, maybe because something happened long ago, but, and somebody said something to them that said they follow Jesus that really stung. And so if somebody doesn't go to them 
and, and extend that same love that they've received, then they're just going to stay in the same place. And so my prayer is that we would catch the heart of God, that we would be like the shepherd who would go after the one and pursue the one no matter what. Can you say amen to that family? Amen. Now, the second thing I want to be able to share with us this morning is number two, you can tell a lot of what you value by what you celebrate. Let me say that again. You can tell what you value by what you celebrate. Now, if you look at the end of the story, what does a shepherd do after he finds the sheep? He rejoices, right? He rejoices. He's like, let's throw a party. Let's have a paina. Do you realize that God celebrates like that? He explodes with excitement and celebration over this. You know what's most Christian churches in America, sadly to say, most Christian churches in America celebrate? You know what we celebrate? We like to celebrate the 99. And, and, and I'm, if I'm being honest, I, I, I do this too sometimes. We look around at our Saturday evening service or Sunday morning service and our favorite thing is when the room is packed and there's like, like only two or three empty chairs and the worship is really good and the preaching is on point and we're like, yeah, man, this is awesome. Like, this is so great. Life is amazing. And we celebrate that. But you know what God probably thinks when he looks at that? He probably, he's probably saying, you know what? I love that they're doing that. I love that they're seeking me. I love that the room is packed. I love that the worship is great and the teaching is good and that, that, that really blesses my heart. But my heart breaks for those three people that didn't show up to sit in those three empty chairs. Those three people that I have great plans for and I want to see them experience all that I have for them. My heart breaks. I celebrate the 99. Don't get me wrong, but my heart really goes after the one. Do you, do you kind of get a picture of what God is, really looks like? What he values, how he feels? You see, God celebrates the one. And I think it, it, it's because there's this direct correlation between what we value and what we celebrate. Let me give you, you another example of this. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, our youth director, Michael, and, and real quick, if you could, just go ahead and, he's awesome, isn't he, our youth director? Good, go ahead and chat in the chat box right now. Type in the chat box, Michael, you're awesome. Thank you for shepherding our youth, man. He's awesome. But a few weeks ago, he shared with our church during the announcements he shared that three students in our youth group gave their lives to Jesus for the first time. And, and three more students that same night rededicated their lives to Jesus. Did you know that? Yeah, like six young people in that evening gave their lives to follow Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy, isn't it? You know, when I heard that, I, I, I was kind of excited. I was thinking, yeah, I like that, man. That's a good number, right? Like, that's good. But if I'm being honest, there wasn't a lot of celebrating going on. Why? Because naturally, we don't think the way that God thinks or value sometimes the things that God values. What do you think God thinks when he heard that number? That six young people made decisions to, to follow Jesus. What do you think he thought? I mean, he celebrates the one, right? I mean, he, imagine him celebrating six Listen, there was a party, an eruption that came from the heart of God that day. And I think it's not always the same reaction for us because we're, we're not really emotionally tied, are we? That, that's just the number, isn't it? But listen, it, it would be completely different if I said it like this. If I said it like this, you know, those out of those six students that came to Jesus a few weeks ago, one of the boys out of the six was, a, um, if I was talking to Uncle Bono, I was, one of those six was your son. Or, or if I was talking to like um, Auntie Andy, like one of those six was your girl. I mean, man, how would they feel? You know, if I heard that, if one of those six were, was one of my child, if I heard that, I would erupt with joy. Why? Because for years, I've been praying for my son to come to God. I've been praying that his life will be changed and he finally understand God's love for himself. Listen, I would explode with excitement. Why? Because there's this emotional connection or compassion that I have for my son. Isn't that true? You know, in another story, you'll hear Jesus share that, and you can read this at home. We're not going to be able to unpack all of it. And so 
Again, Luke chapter 15, write that down, check it out. I wish that we had three more hours to go through this today. But, but just to summarize, in the next three, two stories, Jesus shares about a woman with coins. And, and he says that she had 10 coins and she lost one. And guess what she did? Did she stay with the nine or did she go after the one? She went after the one. And after, after she did that, after she went after the one, what do you think she did when she found it? She partied. Why? Because the loss, the, what was once lost, was now found. Now, he goes on, he tells the last story about this lavishly gracious father. Some people call it the prodigal son story. I would say more so it's a prodigal father story, man, because prodigal in definition is just, it means lavishly giving, lavishly gracious. And the father in the story is lavishly gracious with her, his two sons. One of the sons, it says, gets lost and he makes a bunch of terrible decisions and he hits rock bottom. And so one day he decides that he wants to come back to his father's house and he has this whole speech prepared that, man, dad, I'm not, gonna, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me be a servant to you, work in your fields. And so as he's coming, the father sees him and, and what does the father do? He ran to him. And what do you think the father did after the son came home? He partied. He said, no, 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 you're not a servant. You're not a servant. You're a son. And so he tells them to get, get, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet. Let's have a party. Let's have a, the, kill the fattened calf. Let's make a luau. Why does he do that? Because what God cares about is the one that is lost. There's a story after story, an illustration after illustration about the heart of God throughout the Gospels and even throughout the narrative of Scripture. See, one of the things that God wants us to cultivate in our hearts is a compassion for people, especially those that are far from Him. And I want to ask you this morning is, is this question, where is your compassion at? How much compassion do you have for others? Go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, how are you doing with that? Compassion, how are you doing with that? You would probably fall somewhere, like me and like all of us, we probably fall in this scale on your screen here. It's called the compassion scale. Usually, we all kind of begin on the left side of this compassion scale where we, where we have this compassion for our family and friends. Isn't that true? Like this is kind of, it's kind of natural. As a matter of fact, when you're a parent and your, your kid is born, your, your kid doesn't have to do anything to please you, right? Like they don't have to do anything. They're just born and they don't have to perform. They don't have to do anything. Meaning that you, you, you don't know what they're going to be when they grow up. You don't know if they're going to be smart. You don't know if they're going to be talented. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Because instantly when this kid comes out, there, there's this compassion that is attached to that, that person, that boy or girl. Isn't that true? Why? Because it's a natural place for many of us to give. But if you allow God to start to change your heart, What's going to start to happen is it's, it's going to move to that next level. And what's that next level? That next level is, is it might look like this, is that you'll have, start to have compassion for your coworkers even and acquaintances. That in your heart, there's going to be something that would start to stir and overflow where you're actually caring about them. And you're going to start to think to yourself, man, like, how are they doing today, man? I hope everything's okay. Do they know Jesus? Are they experiencing a life that is fully alive? The thing that Jesus says that we can experience. And if you would allow God in that space to continue to work further, he'll continue to push you in your compassion to even have a compassion for strangers, what, what, like strangers, like the person at Starbucks. Yeah. Like the person at Starbucks. I mean, I actually know people that live at this level. They have so much compassion. It doesn't matter if it's the first time that they meet you or, or th there's this love. There's this love that overflows out of them. As a matter of fact, you know them and I know them too. You know who you know? Pastor Chiomi. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, there's this, like this supernatural overflow of mercy and compassion in her. And many of us have experienced and are here today because of her. Why? Why is that? Because compassion changes things, doesn't it? See, when people can feel that compassion, there's something that happens. There's this overflow that comes out and it changes things. And so if we allow God 
to do deep work in our hearts, He will cause your compassion to go to not just your family and friends, not just your co-workers, not just your strangers, but He'll push it even further and He'll cause your compassion to break even for your enemies. What do you mean? Like my boss or something? No, probably, maybe your boss, but more so people that want to see you fail. People that have hurt you in the past. People that have said things to you that you're still holding on to today. And if you allow the compassion that Jesus is talking about here to take hold of your heart, that, that's what's going ca- to cause the world to change. It's going to cause the world to go, whoa, that's it. That's the real stuff. See, what the world doesn't need to see is a church that just says that, we, man, we have all the answers. They don't need to see a church that, they don't need to see a church that, that, that says we're better than you. They need to see a church that says, listen, no one is perfect. Everyone is welcome and anything is possible. Can you say amen to that family? And listen, when people start to see the compassion of God overflowing in your life, it will start to break down the hardest of hearts for the abundant life to take root. Now, I need to confess to you something that was, that that, that this concept, this idea of compassion for people was really, really easy for me to understand and catch up here. But actually it was really incredibly difficult for me to get down here. I understood in my head, but not fully in my heart. And this is one of my biggest things that I struggled with as I was following Jesus. See, for me, my whole life was consumed by the 99. I would, I would go to church on Sunday. I would have a bunch of church meetings and a bunch of church friends. And I do all of these things. And I knew I'm supposed to be people, around people that were, that were different from me. But, but honestly, I just really didn't. I just really didn't care to. I didn't want to be fake. And so I, I just what, what I started doing is I, I started to, to do something that, that got me out of this little bubble, this little bubble that I was in, this little vacuum that I was in that where I was just around Christians. And so what I did, one of the things that I did is I started to take this Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. <laughs> and what I did was before, af- before and after I would train with these absolute strangers, what I would do is I would walk around the gym and I would start to pray, God, would you give me Eyes of compassion to see these people how you see them. And, and what I did is I started to write down five names of people that I met there that I was going to commit to praying for. And I remember writing their names on a piece of paper and I started praying that these people, my prayer was that these people would encounter God. But more importantly, that God would break my heart and change my heart towards them. Now, I want to fast forward the tape a little bit. But, but two of these people whose names I wrote on this, this paper were just kids when I first met them. They were a brother and sister. And over time, we were able to build a friendship. And I was able to witness God do some amazing things in and through their lives. And I began to notice that God started to do something, not just in them, but in me. Where I was actually genuinely caring about these two people that were once strangers to me years before. And I was able to experience God change my heart and give me a compassion for them that I never could have imagined was possible. Now, currently, these two people, these two wonderful people are both professional fighters. They're they're raising families. And last year and this year, they're they're able to open, both of them, a, a BJJ gym and an MMA gym right here on Oahu. And that God has blessed me over the years to allow me to have the pleasure to officiate their weddings, to bless their businesses, and and, and to celebrate their victories and their lives in Jesus' name. Isn't God amazing? He's awesome. Now, maybe you're here and you can relate to me in my struggle. And and, and you're saying, you're thinking to yourself, man, I I don't really have that compassion towards people. I'm not really a people person. Can I tell you, God can change your heart. Listen, I don't know if you realize this, but sometimes when you pray, when we pray, we don't always have to make requests to God. Did you know that? Did you know that that prayer sometimes isn't just to make requests to God, but it'll actually work to change your heart? And so here's what I want you to do. Here's your for Monday, okay? On your notes or on your bulletin, whatever you're writing on, I want you to write down in five, in big letters, five alive. 
Five Alive. Go ahead and write that down underneath. I want to ask you if you could write down five names. Just start thinking and praying, asking God, write five names that you of, of people that you are going to commit to praying for, that they would have an encounter with God. And by doing that, what you're saying is you're saying, man, I'm going to commit to praying for them over the next year, at least once a week, at least. But I also want to ask you if you could pray that God would begin to give you eyes to see them the way that He sees them and allow God to transform your heart to look more like His. Can you say amen to that family? Now, maybe you're here and and you've never experienced what it's like to follow Jesus. And, and so me telling you to pray for someone is so foreign to you. And so maybe your first step is not that, but maybe your first step is to start a relationship with him. Maybe you've been hurt in the past by people that said they, they were Christian, but didn't look anything like Christ. Or maybe for some of us, you, you, you've struggled with things like, like hurts, habits, and hangups that has kept you from going all in in your relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you? that I think that you watching this today is no coincidence, that God loves you, that He likes you, that He's pursuing you, and I'm believing that He has been trying to get your attention for a while now. And and, and I feel like today, what He's wanting to tell you is, isn't it about time? Isn't it about time to come home and to come alive again? He wants a relationship with you. And so today, I want to lead us in a prayer to help you have a fresh start with Jesus. And I want to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. And listen, there's nothing magical about this prayer. It's just to help guide you to the source of real life, where real life is. And that's with Jesus. As you begin your journey with Him, this is what I want to encourage you to do. is just to to ask Him to come and, and lead your life. Not that you would invite Him into your heart, but that you would follow Him from this day forward. And make Him the Lord and leader of your life. And so I want to ask you if you could bow your heads with me. We're going to pray. And um, would you allow this prayer to be the prayer that comes out of your heart? And so will you repeat after me these words? Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving and accepting me right where I'm at. Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Would you come and fill my life, Holy Spirit, so that I would be empowered to follow you all the days of my life. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. And I say this out loud so I can hear myself, so others can hear me, whoever's in the room, so all of heaven can hear and all of hell that Jesus Christ, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, and you are my king. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's kids said a big amen. Amen and amen. God bless you, family.